Good evening and welcome to the September 14th, 2022 regular meeting of the Woodbridge Board of Selectmen. This meeting is being held by live electronic transmission. Before we begin, because we are remote, I will have to call the roll. First Selectman Beth Hiller here. Deputy First Selectman Sheila McCrevin. Here. Selectman Joe Crisco. Here. Selectman Paul Kiriakos. Here. Selectman David Lober. Here. And Selectman David Vogel. Here. Administrative Officer Finance Director Tony Genovese. Here. Town Council Jerry Weiner. Here. Selectman's Assistant Jerry Shaw. Here. And Media Specialist Pooh Ford is here reporting us and transmitting as well. Thank you, everyone. Item one on the agenda is the Little Library for Peace Place, Ab Abby Sussman. For her bat mitzvah project and we must take action she's not here yet so with your permission i'll just keep going and then hopefully she'll be able to join in and we can go back to that everybody have an injection okay with that i will begin this evening with a quick update on our community center building committee they're making good progress and have asked me and I've agreed that the new name of this ad hoc committee will be the, quote, Community and Cultural Center Building Committee, unquote. This name now better reflects the many uses for this new building, including recreational meeting and cultural spaces, as well as a focal gathering for all residents. Our ad hoc dispatch committee, which, which have had many productive meetings over the past year, has also asked me, and I've agreed, to expand the scope of the committee's charge to include review and discussion of all public safety matters related to fire and police. I am appointing Sophia Morales as the newest member of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. This ad hoc group is planning their next event as part of their successful Woodbridge Reading and Community Program with the book, People Love Dead Jews by Dara Horn on the Center Building Lawn on Tuesday, September 20th at 6.30 p.m. All are invited. The second Woodbridge Like Me Day is scheduled for Sunday, October 9th with a rain date of Monday, October 10th. More information will follow on that. We submitted a steep grant on Monday, August 15th, asking for $500,000 to renovate the gymnasium in the center building into a modern, comfortable, multi-purpose gym and auditorium. As you all know, currently there is no ventilation or air conditioning and the windows are inoperable. This area, which also serves as part of our emergency shelter system, has been nearly unusable due to COVID pandemic. Our proposal includes upgrades to the electrical service to add HVAC to the space, renovate the restrooms, resurface and restrike the wood floors and install safety padding along the walls. I've spoken with both state senators Cabrera and Maroney and state representative Wielander for their support regarding this project. I have good news. The over 55 Toll Brothers project on Bradley Road and Litchfield Turnpike was unanimously approved by the TPNZ Commission last week. Road paving is ongoing with milling completed and paving to begin shortly. As a public service announcement this year, the roads included in paving are Homewood Road, Ford Road, Old Mill Road, Oxbow Lane, and Oak Hill Lane from Rimmon to Highview Drive. <coughs> last month, Tony and I had a meeting with United Illuminating officials, which also included representatives from other towns regarding their recent application to Pura, as they are quote unquote, making their case in 2022, as they put it, for a proposed rate hike. I asked for action regarding rate increase schedule, and it was finally sent last Friday. It is included in your packet and we are posting it on the town website as well. Later this evening under our town council's report, we will be asked to approve a support letter, which I received from conservation Tim Austin this letter will be submitted to the Trust for Public Land regarding a property at 124 Seymour Road. It involves no town funding. When Tony and I met with Tim, I asked him if he knew why the Eldersley Preserve is not named after the Wallace family from whom the town purchased the property. Just an interesting fact. The Wallace family apparently requested that the property honor their family's origins in the town of Eldersley, Scotland, near Glasgow. The mayor of Eldersley came to Woodbridge for the dedication of the preserve. Eldersley is the birthplace of William Wallace, hero of the Scottish people. Mm -hmm. On August 11th, we received notice from the Cable Advisory Council informing us that our grant application was approved 
for $16,724.48. Thank you to Poor Ford for this grant submission and her tireless efforts as WOGAT endeavors to keep our residents informed of all town events and meetings through Channel 79. In conjunction with WSFB and con the Connecticut Police Chiefs Association, Chief Cappiello informed me that our very own officer, Vinnie Lynch, our SRO at Beach Road School, represented the Woodbridge Police Department in the filling of a school safety, filming of a school safety public safety announcement, which was one of several which aired on Channel 3 during their newscasts and program during August and will continue this month. Until we hire a new assistant administrative officer following Be Betsy Yago's departure, I will attempt to give you a list of upcoming events. On Thursday, September 15th, the Woodbridge 20 Task Force invites all residents, business owners, and anyone else for a public information session at 6 p.m. at the New England Brewing Company. This is a great opportunity to meet the committee members, co-chairs Chris Dickerson and Susan Jacobs, Chris Lovejoy, Garrett Luciani, Jeremy Rosner, and Terry Schatz, along with their consultants from Peary and SLR, to share ideas. Currently, they are concentrating on making the town's commercial district more attractive for businesses and consumers. The task force is in close communication with the Economic Development Commission, which has been focusing on support for existing businesses. On Saturday, September 17th, Linden Fair from 1 to 5 p.m. at the Linden of Woodbridge, 330 Amity Road, will include $20 per carload admission, concessions, face painting, petting zoo, music outdoor games, and a dunk tank. All proceeds will go to the Alzheimer's Association. On Sunday, September 25th, Sirens and Sundays program event at the Microbrewery, the newest shop in town at 1652 Litchfield Turnpike from 2 to 4. The first 200 attendees will be treated to two scoops of ice cream. A touch a truck event will have various first responder vehicles on site. Who can say no to free ice cream? On Thursday, September 22nd, the 2022 nominees for the fourth annual Living Treasure Award. Hold on one sec. Just got a note. Okay, great. Thank you. Abby's on. I'll finish up quickly. Uh, our Dwight Roll, Susan Jacobs, Richard James, and the Woodbridge Volunteer Fire Association. These volunteers represent years of public service in so many areas of the town, serving on and volunteering with boards, commissions, and ad hoc committees and building committees, B'nai Jacob, the United Church of Christ, the Land Trust, the Historical Society, Beecher Road School, Amity High School, the Woodbridge Child Care Center, Woodbridge Fathers Baseball League. The Woodbridge Volunteer Fire Association's membership has invited continuous volunteer work with fire prevention and suppression, response to motor vehicle accidents, storms response, medical assistance calls, and helping other agencies. This wonderful community, community building event, which honors Woodbridge seniors, who have volunteered their time over many years also serves as a fundraiser for the Woodbridge Center. If you would like to honor the award winner's contributions to the town by attending the event on Thursday, September 22nd, please contact the Human Services Department to purchase tickets no later than tomorrow, September 15th. On Saturday, October 1st, the 40th annual Woodbridge Road Race, the fun run is at 9 a.m. at the Fitzgerald Walking Trail. The 5K run starts at 10.30 in front of the library on Meeting House Lane. Registration is online only up until race time. From 8 a.m. to 12 noon, the Woodbridge Police will have a table at the road race near registration in conjunction with Human Services, collecting donations for the Woodbridge Food Pantry. Saturday, October 15th, the Nicole Donzello Tasting Fundraiser in honor of my dear friend, Nicole Donzello, will happen. This event is scheduled from 7 to 10 at the Woodbridge Club at 10 Millhaven Road. Tickets can be purchased online and features over 50 wines, over 13 breweries, over 15 restaurants, a DJ, and an auction. Proceeds benefit leukemia patients and their families at Smilo Cancer Hospital. On Monday, October 31st, also known as Halloween, must save the date for the annual truck retreat sponsored by the Woodbridge Volunteer Fire Association. More info to follow as we go closer to the event. I attended the annual Masaro Dinner on the Farm event on this past Saturday, September 20th. As always, it was a beautiful evening. Lastly, regarding the Open Community Civil Lawsuit, my quote will be, the town will defend this case and we fully expect to be successful. We are a diverse and wonderful community, which will be demonstrated at trial, and I am committed to contesting the claims made by the lawyers who brought the suit. 
Thank you. And with that, we will go back to item one on the agenda, the Little Library for Peace Place, and I will introduce Abby Sussman for her Bat Mitzvah project. Hi, Abby. Hi, this is Hi, sorry, I came a bit late. I had some technical issues. No worries, a lot of us do. <laughs> Welcome. The floor is yours, my friend. Thank you. So basically, my name is Abby Sassman, and I'm doing a community project for my bot mitzvah. For this project, I'm building little free libraries and giving and going to be placing them in different communities. One of these communities, I wanted to put them in locally, so I chose Woodbridge in Pease Park. And basically, what's going to happen is I'm going to build these libraries and fill them with books that I've gathered, then place it in this location. And from then, people will be able to come and go as they please, taking books, donating books, and just sharing books in general. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we have your, your uh, letter in our packet, so I think we're pretty well informed on, on what you want to do. I think it's wonderful, of course. Thank you. We need more libraries like this. It's great. Um, does any member of the board selectmen have any questions for Abby? I have a quick question, Abby. Can you tell us if you've decided where at Pease Place you want to locate your library, or will you determine later? That is something that I have not determined yet, but I am planning on putting it next to some sort of benches mm -hmm. so that you would be able to sit down as you enjoy a book. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. Okay, great. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, Abby. Uh, um, do you have a source for your books? Actually, what I'm going to be doing is since how I mentioned before that this is for my bot mitzvah project, I will be sending out an invite to people at my temple, to friends and family, and be collecting books as donations. Then I will, and I have a goal on how many books I would like for to overall gather. And if we do not meet, and if I do not reach my goal, I will be spending my own money to buy the rest of the books. I, I have a little free library, so I'm going to give you a tip. The Bethany Library has free books that they remain there, a lot of children's books, especially children's books. So you can go there and you can pick up um, as many books as you like for your little free library. There's one, one little caveat. They're in the process of remodeling, and they moved all those books somewhere, so they may not yet be available. Um, but you can check that out. That's where I got a lot of my books. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Great. Anyone else? Okay, with that, I will make a motion that we approve the uh, Little Library for Peace Place uh, is presented this evening by Abby Sussman. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the proposal or the motion? Hearing none, I will call the roll. First Selectman Beth Heller, aye. Deputy First Selectman Sheila McCreven. Aye. Selectman Joe Crisco. Aye. Selectman Paul Kyrikos? Aye. Selectman David Lober? Aye. And Selectman David Vogel? Absolutely. <laughs> and with that, it's unanimous, and thank you so much. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. And with that, we will move on to item three, the Woodbridge Board of Education, Interim Superintendent Christine Seriak. She's here. Sorry, it wasn't letting me unmute. <laughs> Did the video start? Yep, we got you. Oh, okay. Well, no, you went away again. Okay, I think I'm back. Okay, yep, there you are. Okay, sorry about that. I also have technical issues, so. Good evening. Um, thank you very much for asking me to join you this evening. Um, so school is in session. We started school since the last time I met with you. All appears to be running smoothly. Uh, we were able to have our open houses in person 
uh, for the first time since 2019. So it was very nice to welcome people back into our building. Um, and it feels really good that we're at that point where we're able to have the community come back into Beecher Road School and attend events in person. Um, I wanted to share with the Board of Selectmen that our current enrollment is right around 850 students. Um, and where many districts in Connecticut have experienced declining enrollments over the past several years, that has not been the case in Woodbridge. Um, and I think that's a testament to your town leadership and the fact that people select to move to Woodbridge uh, for the strong school system. We did conduct a uh, projected enrollment study, which was done in June. And based on that study, it indicates that by 2031, which is just around eight school years away from now, uh, the enrollment will be uh, potentially near 1,991 students. So that's an additional 150 students that will be attending Beecher Road School. Um, I bring this up because we are currently utilizing all the instructional spaces at Beecher Road School. And after the summer recreation program concluded, we needed to request that the town move their offices because we needed to use that area as classroom space and i know that was a great inconvenience but i do want to thank um, the recreation department as well as the town for um, helping us with that to provide another classroom setting for our students here um, at beecher road school so if there's a need down the road to add additional sections at grade levels um, that will mean that more of our specialist teachers such as art or other special areas, music um, may have to go onto a cart because we would need that classroom space for whether it's an additional kindergarten or first grade or second grade. And that's not an ideal way for us to do instruction. Um, and eventually we don't even have a lot of space to be able to do that either. So I just wanted to plant a seed and I'm sharing it with the town um, so that you can continue to have discussions about um, what might have to happen eight years down the road in order to house an additional 150 students. And I certainly know that time goes by very quickly. Um, so I would be remiss not to bring it up now and wait seven years. Uh, so last spring, the district also began to develop a five-year strategic plan. The committee that met in the spring was comprised of a variety of building staff members that included administration and teachers and paraeducators. Um, we also had parents and some board of education members. And the committee uh, formalized focusing on three goals over the next five years. And those goals will help to drive some of the decision-making moving forward in regard to um, curriculum or professional learning etc in the district uh, one of the goals is on academic framework the second goal is on contemporary learners and the third goal is on building diverse and healthy alliances within the district so the next step for the strategic planning process is uh, we've now grouped teachers together into three groups they will each represent one of those three goals, and they're going to develop an action plan to cover the next 18 months. Well, actually, from like January till June of 2024, as to how to begin to implement the strategic plan. And then at some point in um, mid 2024, they will relook at the plan and extend it out further as far as what actions to take. Um, I would also like to take the time this night to thank the Board of Selectmen for your creation of a building committee to take a look at some of the repair work that needs to be done at Beecher Road School. I know that the roof project has been, you know, on the horizon for a couple of years now. Um, so I just want to say that we really appreciate that and I look forward to seeing um, where that takes us in the future. We do have a Board of Education meeting on Monday evening. And the Board of Ed has contracted the Cade Search Services to find a new superintendent for the Woodbridge School District. 
And on Monday evening, the search service will share a presentation of the leadership profile, which is based off of all of the um, focus groups and surveys that the search group has been doing over the past few weeks in regards to what it is the community is looking for in the new superintendent. So um, that's all I have for this evening, uh, unless you have any questions for me. Anyone from the board have any questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you very much too. Thank you for joining us this evening. Take care. Item four on the agenda is police body cams update from police chief Frank Capriello. I believe he's here. There he is. Hi, Frank. Hi, everybody. Good evening. So thanks for having me tonight. And um, so I just want to talk about our body cameras and give you an update where we're at. The replacement and upgrading of our current body worn and dashboard camera systems to a newer, more technology advanced system is supported by the police commission. And is something we've been planning for and discussing for several months now. Back in May, I submitted a formal request for consideration that a portion of the American Rescue Act ARPA funding be awarded to the town um, could possibly be used for the project. And as a backup to that, I plan to propose that also as a five-year project commencing with our upcoming fiscal 23-24 budget preparation. We began planning for this several months ago after being informed by the New Haven State's Attorney's Office that they're in the process of drafting a uniform policy regarding sub submission of camera footage by law enforcement to their office. Rather than using the old method of submitting evidence on disk and making sure the file formats are compatible as we currently do, agencies would be required to share dashboard and body-worn camera footage directly to court by trans transmitting it via download through a designated access portal. Subsequent to the start of the camera mandates associated with the police accountability bill, prosecutors have also commented as to the inferior, inferior quality of the images that we are submitting to them via our older technology versus the high quality imagery being submitted by agencies um, now using the camera system that they, they've enacted after the Police Accountability Act. They advised us that Axon is the most common camera system being used by the 13 agencies encompassing the geographical district of the New Haven Court and we are only one of the few departments not utilizing the same. Most recently, during the past few months, we've experienced um, unexpected back-to-back -back major failures with two of our vehicle dashboard cameras that have rendered the camera systems inoperable and have forced us to take both those cars out of service for the time being. So that's what uh, brings me here this evening. Up until recent, any malfunctions of our body-worn cameras or dashboard cameras were able to be repaired either by us on site with replacement parts or by returning them to the factory. The body-worn and dashboard system uh, components are all integrated together that pursuant to the, you know, the recent uh, police accountability bill, they're all required to be synchronized together. So now when a dashboard camera is activated, the officer's body-worn camera is also automatically activated, it begins recording at the same time. We were on the forefront as one of the first PDs years ago to implement the use of a dashboard and then body-worn cameras. And that went back to 2010, well before it became mandatory with the new accountability bill. So currently five of our 10 dashboard cameras have been in service since the original 2010 date of purchase. So as a result, we have a good portion of this 10 to 12 year old technology equipment still in place that, that needs, um, needs to be uh, upgraded to more advances to more, more, more modern technology. Our current vendor is Digital Allied. They have notified us that all of our dashboard camera units have now reached their end of life and necessary parts to repair them are no longer available. So when they fail, the only solution is a replacement of the entire unit. And that's what we're faced with today. We have one patrol vehicle that was purchased late, uh, was purchased last fiscal year, all the way back last October, we ordered it. And after a 10 month wait due to supply chain delays, that vehicle has finally arrived and is scheduled to be upfitted at the dealer 
with the emergency lighting radio and the camera system as, as, as is customarily done. And when we do that, the systems are transferred over from the old vehicle to the new vehicle. The problem is we have no working cameras to put in, in this new car. This is to be followed shortly thereafter by the outfitting of a second new patrol vehicle for this fiscal year, which also needs a camera. Because each type of camera is configured and wired differently, I need to advise a dealer if we're going to supply them with a new digital alley dashboard camera or we're going to upgrade and switch over to another vendor. The current price to replace just one of our current digital ally dashboard camera systems alone has significantly risen from the past pricing of flat one time amount of just under $5,000 to a price of $10,900 per unit payable in five year increments of $2,180 currently. And that doesn't include the replacement of any of our other end of life cameras should they fail. Replacing them with digital ally equipment and having different, different levels of, of the same equipment presents us with uh, some system compatibility and body worn camera synchronization and, com and uniformity issues. As some of our body cameras will then not work with some of the new, the new um, cameras put in those two cars. And that, that, that creates quite a problem for us because then officers won't be able to use every car and have everything sync up at the same time. So with that said, although this is several months earlier than we were planning, we've reached a point where it's critical for us to switch over to a company that has proven technological and performance track record of quality imaging and reliability with the courts and the agencies around us that have been using the Axon brand cameras for, for some time now. Axon offers a complete five-year plan of new fully installed dashboard and body ward cameras uh, system being used throughout the majority of the agencies in our court district, as I mentioned, and throughout the state and across the country at a price of approximately, for us it would be a cost of approximately $45,000 per year for 10 dashboard cameras and 23 body worn cameras. Of most importance, they will provide a complete upgrade and replacement of all of our body worn cameras initially on day one, a refresh at years two and a half, and at the end of the contract at year five. And for the dashboard cameras initially on day one and again at day five. So throughout that period, the body cams will be um, upgraded and the dash cams will be upgraded at the, and at the, at the end of the five years, we'll have uh, new systems to move on with. Their pricing also includes adequate cloud-based stores and the access portal accessibility and licensing to be used in the seamless trans transmission of our footage to court, as I had mentioned previously. As far as Axon goes, um, we at the police department already have a long standing relationship with their company as we've been using them um, without any problems for several years now for all of our taser equipment and the uh, software needs that were associated uh, with that. So these recent unexpected dashboard camera recording system failures are something that we urgently need to, to uh, address right away, not only to keep our patrol fleet in service, but for officer safety, public transparency, for the judicial system, and to stay in compliance with the police accountability bill mandates. We, we all know, you know the, failure to have, that the failure to have proper operational equipment can present a major liability as it relates to civil litigation. As I said, the new cruisers are at the dealership. They're scheduled to be upfitted, but without the new cameras, we won't be able to put them into service. And I don't really want to, you know, come before you tonight and ask for you know, two digital ally cameras just to replace those two and then have to come back repeatedly with the same requests as our other digital ally cameras uh, continue to have associated malfunctions that will only continue as time goes on. So tonight I respectfully request that you assist us with promptly moving forward with a change to the new Axon body worn and dashboard camera systems, which in addition to being a huge jump in technology for us, would ensure our day-to-day -day operations and would greatly enhance professionalism and the high standards of our department. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, Tony, what would be the next steps? Uh, so um, I've, if the um, 
this is more of an informative uh, uh, for the board to hear about our latest, um, the, the chief's uh, latest uh, predicament with his um, his cameras and his uh, body cameras. So we want to just inform you of of what um, you know what the options were, and so the next step would be to put together the funding for this particular fiscal year that would be involved in the purchasing piece, which is um, is purchased off a national contract. It's called Sourcewell. They've done a number of things for us, and we find that that has the best per, uh, the best price for the camera setup. And um, we would pull that paperwork together and present it for you at your next meeting. Your funding options are to either, I mean, there's several options, but the two that we were thinking was to either use the um, the uh, ARPA funds as our chief had originally requested, but um, another option would be to pay for it over time in the budget. So each year you would appropriate uh, essentially one fifth of the um, camera system so that it's paid for over a five year period. Can you get them all right away, but then you just pay it? Correct. Okay. Right. Okay. So you'll put together something, I guess, and perhaps if, back. Yeah, if, if, they, if uh, this is something you're interested in, in reviewing further, we can certainly put together the information for your October uh, meeting. To me, it sounds like we have to do this. There's no other, we looked at, there's no grants available, correct? I, I did reach out to the state folks. Yeah, correct. And what we found were all the grants, unfortunately, were for agencies that had no body cameras. So we were ahead of the curve. We did the right thing. And at, at this point, <laughs> we're kind of behind the eight right. as far as get punished for doing the right thing. <laughs> David, you had something? Go ahead. I Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if when this uh, Accountability Act was passed, no funding for coming up to compliance with it? So there, there was there no funding done at that same time by the state or whoever passed it. No grant funding, not for agencies that had the equipment already, but had it in place. Interesting. I, and we, uh, the other question I have is, uh, sounds like every officer has their own body camera. Correct. Right, and and is that part of the? Is part of the requirement of the legal uh, thing, or is it is it ever possible that people don't have their own? That there's a, you know, we don't have twenty three officers ever on duty at the same time. No, but the common practice is that everyone's issued um, issued a body camera. And it's kind of just like everyone's issued a their own portable radio and, um, and different items, so they have it, so they would not have to worry about getting one from another. And it does also come into play if. We did have a malfunction or one's out of service, then we would be able to, to do that. So does that mean if we are changing over to a different system and a different need of integration, starting with our new vehicles this year, that all 23 cameras are going to have to be, well, every camera has to be changed in the entire system all at once, correct? Yes, because everything has to sync up and work together, correct. Right. So that's, that's what it is now. It'd just be a whole nother company doing that, yeah. <clears throat> and there's no way that we can do it over time. We just have to do it all at the same time, or maybe and maybe as Tony said, pay for it over time. We pay for it over time. We just the equipment comes at the same time what we pay for it over time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was, and that's that was, that's the common way that they're that they're doing it. That's what happened with Digital Ally before we were able to buy just a single dash camera at the went for $5,000 and be done with it. Now they jumped the price up like that and made it payment incrementally over, over the years. It's, same and thing, it's, same thing. The company has structured this specifically so that company departments can afford to, you know, instead of having to outlay the, the whole thing at once, you know, they've, you know, structured it so that it's more affordable on it, you know, over time. But Tony, I had a quick question about the funding aspect of it, because I think I understand that it, it's going to make sense to do this. And obviously, <laughs> you, you had presented this during our capital budget process last year, so you know we knew it was coming. Um, but Tony, if we were to take the option of paying for it over time, does that come out of capital? And would it be po if that's the case, would it be possible that if later on we decide to allocate some of the ARPA money, we could 
pay, you know, if we set it up to pay over time, we could potentially put ARPA money against it as well, or we have that's to- a, That's a good that. question. That's a good question. I'd have to see the actual documentation. I don't have any agreements. The, from my discussions with them, yes, you can pay for a portion of it and then pay the rest off at a particular time, but without seeing an actual agreement, you know, I'd have to see that first, but the, the um, representative from the company led me to believe that that would be possible. Okay. Cause I'd hate to see us delaying the decision. Sounds like it's needed eminently and it would be faster to do it as a, um, a capital budget outlay. Yeah, yeah. It would be faster to do it as an outlay than yeah. it would with the ARPA process, as you know. Right. But then if we have ARPA left at the end that we could allocate to that, we could maybe do both. Could. You could. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Does It does sound like the state is incentivizing us not to be early adopters. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. This time we need to be a real late adopter so that we can get <laughs> more funding for it. Okay. So I think it's probably the consensus of the board that we have Tony look into this further and uh, bring it back to us in... October, and I'm sure, Chief, if we have further questions, we can reach out to you at any point. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you thank for you. bringing this to our attention. Okay, thank you all. Okay, thank guys. You. Thanks. Uh, next on the agenda is public comments, which we do not do until 6 p.m., so we will move right on to the next item, which is, we can get started at least, the Administrative Officer Director Finance Report, Mr. Genovese. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I have the um, a year end report for you, and um, it looks a little different than what you're uh, customarily used to seeing. And what it is is a um, preliminary statement of our revenues, expenditures, and fund balance for the fiscal year 2022. So um, if you if you look at the um, the spreadsheet, it's probably a good place to start. The um, year end preliminarily is a uh, surplus of revenues of $762,000, which is the difference between a final budget and the actual. And that mainly comes from a few different sources. The first is a reimbursement from uh, FEMA uh, for um, expenses from a previous year, uh, from storm expenses from a previous year. So while it's a surplus in this particular year, it was an expense in the previous year. So. Um, the second is um, we received an additional $255,000 in special education excess cost grant funds. Again, these are reimbursing us for expenditures at the Board of Education, but show up as a surplus in our revenues because we had only budgeted about $70,000 from that grant. Um, and third, the uh, building permit, which is in fact a surplus, uh, building permits had a, a surplus of $224,000 just due to increased activity and primarily work being done at the uh, Regional Water Authority. Uh, so that's where a good, decent portion of that came from. So those are sort of all playing into the um, revenue surpluses that we have this year. Uh, our expenditures have a surplus of $384,000. And uh, that comes from, uh, I've just highlight some of the major items. Um, one is police department. Is a surplus of a little under $47,000. That's primarily due to staffing changes and staffing adjustments as either with injuries or as people leave and people come on board. <clears throat> Occasionally you have a situation where, um, you, you know, you have a vacancy and so there's not wages being paid. And, and um, sometimes that um, there's overtime as a result of that. But in this particular year, the, um, the uh, was a surplus as the overtime did not uh, outweigh or was not greater than the uh, savings in wages. Uh, the building official had a um, surplus of about thirty one thousand dollars. That's due. To, he that's just due to how much time he needs to spend and what we had budgeted that particular year. Um, Public Works had a surplus of fifty eight thousand dollars. They had some um, savings in their contracted services. Human Services and the library were very similar. Uh, they each had surpluses uh, due to part-time wages relating to uh, primarily to the um, full, bringing back, coming back to full-time programming after COVID. <coughs> and, and finally, the Woodbridge Board of Ed is returning $37,000 to the town. 
So if you combine those two, you have a um, excess of revenues over expenditures of about $1.1 million. Now the town uh, has designated fund balance of $400,000 each year. So that leaves us with an actual surplus of $743,000. So it sort of lays it all out on the schedule and shows you, I think, quite um, nicely how you get to um, the uh, excess of revenues over expenditures of 743,000. So that leaves us with a, a fund balance of just about $8 million or 15, a little over 15, a little under 16%, 15.7% of our um, budget. So those are some of the highlights from the fiscal year. Um, are there any questions or? Yes. Uh, Tony, um, I don't see anything from the from the Amity budget here. If you could comment on that. Sure. So the Amity budget was um, for the next fiscal year for twenty three. So the Amity budget was um, was uh, voted down twice, which means that in the, the twenty twenty three, which is the fiscal year we're in, this is from last fiscal year I just presented. Uh, the fiscal year that we're in, you'll see next month where you'll have a surplus in the Amity line because we'll be giving them less than we actually budgeted for. So that's for the, a year coming up. Is that, is, that, is that what you were wondering? I was actually wondering wondering about the, uh, the surplus that they have in their budget now. Oh, okay. Are yep. that going to be returned or, or what? So they, in this particular budget, uh, we had, the way the surplus works with Woodbridge is, um, we do not budget for a surplus until we actually receive it from the high school, from this district. So we, um, in this particular budget of 2022, fiscal year 22, this is from, I believe they're 2020 operations. So we received that money uh, back in January of last year. And therefore, uh, I mean, the January of the year before, and therefore when we did the 2022 budget, we were able to um, put it in here and it's $611,000. Find that in here. So we 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 do not budget for the surplus or um, until we actually receive the surplus, so. Okay, and I so guess the question is, are we going to receive the surplus or has that that changed? Has that uh, rule changed? I'm, I'm told that that's being discussed. I haven't received any confirmation one way or the other, but there is some discussion on uh, the district keeping the surplus and reducing their budget by that amount. So we would we would not actually see it, but their budget would be reduced by a surplus that they um, have at the end of the year. Right now, the way it works is they give us the surplus and then we reduce, you know, after the fact. Yeah, yeah. It's, an account, it's an accounting thing. Yep. Right, exactly, right, right. Okay, thank you, I clarified. Okay. Tony, I was going to ask, thank you, Dr. Lower. You asked uh, several of my Amity questions. So I just had one I more. Just asked one question. Okay. Yeah, well, those were good ones, though. They were uh, different pieces of it. Uh, so, Tony, I guess the, 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 in terms of timing, it is not until January that we were going to recognize the surplus that ended June 30. So, so nothing has changed since June 30. Uh, until January, and then we're either going to get some money that was designated as surplus on June thirtieth, or we're not going to get it. Correct. That right? That's correct. So if we get the if we if we get the surplus in January, then we would have discussions on how to use that in the twenty four budget, which will be take right. that discussion will take place in this spring. If we do not get the surplus, then you'll have you know a six seven hundred thousand uh, dollar shortfall already in your budget without even doing anything because that'll be 600 or 700, it's like it's $611,000 uh, that we will not be getting from them because we're not getting the surplus. So by, by them, <laughs> now, does that mean their budget will be lower? I, I don't know how that'll work, but so I can tell so you that our <laughs> revenues will be short because we will not be getting the surplus from them. Right. So essentially, they're they're potentially the um, budget they're going to be asking for for the next May's referendum is going to be impacted by this lack of return of funds. That's that's the first time. discussion. That's okay. the discussion. Whether whether what happens, I don't know. But I'll the wait and see. Uh, so right. Right. Thank you. Okay. 
Go ahead, David. Yeah, uh, Tony, is the, is the likelihood that there will still be invoices and so forth that are yet to be accounted for on this, or is this pretty much done? It's pretty much it. Okay. The only other, the only other thing that we're um, could impact this is if there's an audit adjustment. If they if they go through our the books and they see something and they oh this should be booked back to last year or this you know, this should be reduced or whatever, but no, no like activity. So we ought to commend the Amity Regional Schools for having a one dollar surplus. <laughs> That's fine tuning at its best. Uh, uh, and Beth, I, I do remember that you you did request that uh, on the behalf of the town that they actually return the money. So that was that message has been sent. Uh, the question I really had, Tony, is it normal for us to see an end of year with uh, so many positive uh, variances on the budgets, like all of them being a little bit under budget? Is that it's so usually typical? Yeah, I, I try to. Um to make sure that all the departments, well, it's actually um, something I've always done is to make sure that every single department has a positive balance or a zero balance. So uh, we have historically here uh, made sure that our uh, the budget controls at the department level. So while line items may go over budget, our department con our budget controls at the department level. So each department has to be either a zero or a plus at the end of the year. So that's okay. why you see. Do we do that by shifting with, when we make these changes in our monthly shifts of, of money around? That's how we handle that? That's correct. Exactly. Every month, if I see a department, and there's always like certain areas that you have to look out for over time is one, uh, benefits are another. You know, it's historically things that can get out of control quickly that are hard to control. So you have to keep an eye on those. Um, and every month, if I see something that looks like it's gonna be an issue, that's when we give a funding request. I, I was just wondering how it, it normally looks. And thank you, that's great. And you have, a new, and the other thing, David, that I could say is you have a lot of very cooperative department heads. Oh, They're very great. aware of their budget. They yeah. are. <laughs> yeah. they, they know who their boss is, is that right? Tony? <laughs> They know where the money comes from, I guess. That's, okay. Yes, yeah, essentially, yeah. Yeah, good. Thank the you. Other, the only other thing I want to mention is, um, so with the shortfall of the Amity uh, funds, you know, that's a time to discuss the fund balance in the budget process and where, you know, how that all plays into all this. So, you know, that's when you would discuss how that impacts the budget and, and uh, you know. That was it. Thank you very much. Anyone right. else? Okay, we'll move on to uh, funding requests. We have a couple, mostly line item transfers, which is a good thing within departments. Uh, the first one is line item transfer number 2223-01 in the amount of 4,000. Uh, this is transfer request uh, within to I'm sorry, to address dead and dying trees that need to be removed or trimmed. I will move acceptance of line item transfer 2022 23 01 in the amount of $4,000. Tony, is there any discussion? Actually, I'd like to make a request. Uh, yep. Warren, Warren is waiting um, in the um, as an attendee, and the next two transfers, along with the next two agenda items, involve Warren. So I figured it's a good time to bring him on board. Didn't see him, but I see him now. Okay, my apologies. I didn't know. I'm here, if you can hear me. We can, thank you, Warren. I can't see you, but we can hear you. This is a pretty basic request from Warren to address some uh, trees. Uh, this is a year long process and um, and, and depending on the volume and the activity, uh, Warren you know, may have to come back for additional funding at a later date. Do you want us to vote on this one now or do you want to wait until we do the other two? We could do this one now. Okay, so I moved acceptance. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any questions or discussions for either Tony or Warren on this one? Hearing none, Beth Heller, aye. Sheila McCrevin? Aye. <laughs> Joe Crisco? Aye. Paul Kirikos? Aye. David Lober? Aye. And David Vaughn? Aye. Thank you. We'll move on to the next one, 2023-02 in the amount of $32,000. 
This is uh, funding. This transfer rather is to transfer funds from one capital account, which is for vehicles and transfer it to another capital account, which is for heavy equipment. And, and, and that is because um, Warren has determined uh, with much discussion uh, with me and um, others and his evaluation that the boom mower that um, uh, we have, which is from 1997, believe it or not, needs to be replaced desperately. And I'll let Warren speak a little about that. Yeah, the, we, we've been, well, first of all, because of the age, parts uh, is limited in, or not available in some cases. We've been nursing the equipment along, uh, trying to keep it operational because of the necessity to, to mow. And uh, we've had significant downtime over this past year, uh, but sometimes the, the issue is we go out with the mower and the operator will come back and it would be either overheating or some other uh, dilemma with the machine. So we don't have full service of it. And it is a necessity for our operation. Um, when I was trying to get the prices on the machine, I was fortunate enough at the uh, uh, the uh, Casho uh, show, which is the municipal equipment uh, demonstration. Um, the vendor that we would like to purchase one from happened to be there, and another municipality uh, loaned their machine to the vendor to have it on site. Um, there's been significant modifications as far as mobility from what we're currently using and operational standpoints. Um, and so I looked at the spec over it with the mechanic and the former mechanic uh, that is now working at the transfer station. Um, but they agreed that the machine would be most suited for our operation. The problem we had was is like most things, there's been a price increase from um, the, that was available and we just missed the window. So a little bit more and the, the machine is currently higher than what we had budgeted. So the transfer request becomes a necessity to acquire the machine. Just so, just so you're clear, the machine is mainly worn for mowing roadsides, correct? Yeah, this is the one with the arm. You can uh, mow banks or behind guide rail, um, or just to be, we have a necessity to keep it out mowing with the other mower. Um, it's it's a it's a mower that goes out. It's a lot of here, right? and even the growth right now. If we had the manpower, we'd be out there doing second mowings in some cases. Uh, so it is vital to the operation of the department. Is this related to a bid waiver as well? Correct. Okay. This is the funding for the bid waiver. Okay. I see that later on in the in the agenda, but um, I guess right now we just need to do the transfer, correct? Right. Okay. So I will move acceptance of line item transfer number 2223-02 in the amount of $32,000. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Warren or Tony on this one? Hearing none, uh, Selectman David Vogel? Aye. David Lober? Aye. Paul Kiriakos? Aye. Joe Crisco? Aye. Sheila McCreven? Aye. And Beth Heller? Aye. Thank you. And Warren, I guess this is the next one. 2023-03 in the amount of 10,000. This is a uh, Warren can hang tight. These don't involve Warren. Oh, yep. I see that American endowment. All right. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I, I'll move acceptance of line item transfer number 2223-03 in the amount of $10,000. A request to transfer donation from American Endowment Foundation to the capital budget for the purchase of a speed awareness monitoring trailer. Oh, this is a really good thing. If you want to explain it a little bit, it's wonderful. Sure, the police department received a donation from um, uh, two residents in the amount of $10,090. And the uh, donation was um, to uh, use the funds to purchase a new speed awareness trailer for the Woodbridge Police Department. So that's what we're requesting. Wonderful. Right. It's a donation from Mr. Michael Weiner and Ms. Cheryl Dawson of 36 Eldersley Lane. So we will make sure we send them a thank you note should the board approve this. So I motioned it. Is there a second? 
Like it. Thank you, Joe. Any questions or anything for Tony? I, for Tony or for me? Go ahead, David. I, I'd just like to say that I know that same uh, resident is was very pleased with Warren's work to do some of the cleanup after Coopop had uh, was talking about the littering rule, and we talked to the police chief, and we talked to uh, about whether or not we were going to put in another uh, littering ordinance. And uh, the response that the that our public works uh, did to help uh, clean up a problem area along the streets, I think, is a good step in the right direction for us to keep our town cleaner. I'd like to, like to just say that I'm glad to see that they are happy enough to do more for the town. Wonderful. So we have a motion and a second. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, um, Beth Heller votes aye. Sheila McCreven? Aye. David Lober? Aye. David Vogel? Aye. Joe Crisco? Aye. And Paul Kyriakos? Aye. Thank you so much. And we'll make sure we send a note from the town as well to them. Thank you. 2223-4. Okay, this transfer request is to transfer grant funds to the Woodbridge Government Access Television Budget for professional development equipment upgrades and a service contract. This is the $16,724.43 that I spoke about in my remarks from the grant that Poole very wonderfully got for us. So I will move acceptance of this line item transfer. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Anything you want to add on this, Tony? It's uh, we have a letter from Pula attached to the uh, packet. Nope. I'm not almost set. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for anything? It's a great thing. So thank you for that. I'll call the roll. Uh, Paul Kyriakos. Aye. David Lober. Aye. David Vogel. Aye. Joe Crisco. Aye. Sheila McCreven. Aye. And Beth Heller. Aye. That's great. Okay, uh, I see Frank is he still here just in case we have some questions. Line item transfer number 2023-05 in the amount of $5,045. Necessary additional funding to purchase two vehicles for the police department is approved in the FY23 capital budget. And there is a memo attached to your packet from Chief Capiello for further details. Wanna add anything to this, Tony? No, I think the memo is self-explanatory. I agree. Anyone have any questions for Tony, Frank, Chief, or me? Yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, so we're pur purchasing two new vehicles. One of them's a hybrid and one of them's not. Uh, we have had a long discussion about the advantages of hybrid uh, technology, the, the lower cost over time of operating, the lower cost of uh, maintaining the vehicles, um, the, the, reduction in, the reduction in pollution. Uh, and uh, there's also a state mandate to, to replace our, our fleet with hybrid and electric vehicles. Um, I, would, I would make a push to make both of those vehicles hybrid as long as we're buying two new vehicles. Anyone want to respond to that? Frank's still here, yeah. Yeah, I could, I could respond. Um, Dr. Lover, I, I did check on that. And there, the problem is they're having a problem with um, Production from Ford, like I said, we, you know, the one car we were waiting for last time took um, 10 or 11 months to get in now. But the issue is, I checked, I was going to try to get a uh, get both hybrids, but they have no 2022 uh, police patrol SUVs in the hybrid model available. And they do not know if they're going to, what, what quantity levels they'll have. We want to order a 2023. So that's where we ran into a problem. Um, they don't know if they, they're going to be able to have them available in 2023, and they weren't able to give us the pricing yet for the 2023s. So this would have, these two vehicles that we're getting would be 2022s, um, but they're available right away, which would help us out tremendously with our repairs and high mileage vehicles. But moving forward for the, in preparation of the capital budget for the upcoming year, I'll put them both in as hybrids, and um, if, you know if this one works out well, we don't have any problem with trying it, especially in the other two. I understand. Okay. And you need to replace um, two vehicles right now. Yes, because our, our 
probably looking at our budget, yeah, our mileages are excessively high. And that was a big concern that the mechanic had stressed before that if we have to wait another, you know, order a car now and then wait a whole almost a year to get it in service, it's really going to um, be a hardship. And it's, it's something actually all the um, area police departments are experiencing. Um, we, we're dealing with it at the uh, at the chief's meeting to talk about everybody's trying to get cars and supply and demand is just um, overwhelming because they're not able to keep up. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Chief, I have a quick question for you. Um, because we buy such low volume, is that why we're not able to get something if we were buying a you know greater number of cars or if we banded together with maybe other scrog communities and bought cars? Would we get any benefit if we did that? No, because they 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 match the contract price and actually the dealer that we that we've been using for the last several years now is MHQ and they're the probably one of the biggest dealers around. They do they buy the vehicles in bulk. Um, and for the state police and pretty much most of the people buy their cars there. The only delay we have is because because we only have one or two cars being upfitted by them. So sometimes there's a little bit of a delay on that where, you know, they have a whole fleet of state police cars waiting and we're just one um, small uh, agency in there. So it kind of gets held back a little bit with that. But, but they've been pretty accommodating. And in um, the fact, these two cars that they were able to get they held them verbally for us because of our relationship, but those are ones that they bought anticipating that departments are going to want them. So that's what she said. If we're not going to get them, if we're not, if we're not interested or we're not able to get them right now, um, she wasn't really worried about it because everybody else is waiting for the same thing. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. I will move acceptance of line item transfer number 2023-05 in the amount of $5,045. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any further questions or discussions on this? Hearing none, First Selectman Heller, Beth says, aye. Sheila McCreven? Aye. Joe Crisco? Aye. Paul Curicos? Aye. David Lober? Aye. And David Vogel? Aye. Thank you so much. Line item transfer number 2023-06 in the amount of $9,410.24. Replacement of aged and stripped wires at the fiber optic connection from the Human Services Department to the Police Department radio room. Very important to the integrity of the network. Anybody want to take that one? Tony or? Yeah, this would be, for, this would be mine. Um, so this was discovered in a uh, review of our network, and um, it's just something we have to do. Uh, it's it's um, you know it's an old fiber optic connection that was not replaced when we replaced a lot of the re the rest of the network. So has to be done. Yeah. Okay. I'll move acceptance of line item transfer twenty twenty three zero six in the amount of nine thousand four hundred ten dollars and twenty four cents. Is there a second? Second. Any questions or discussions further to be had? Okay. Uh, Selectman David Vogel? Aye. Selectman Lober? Aye. Selectman Curicos? Aye. Selectman Crisco? Aye. Selectman Grevin? Aye. And Beth Heller, aye. Thank you very much. Okay. Yikes. Light item transfer 2023 07 in the amount of $15,804. 69 cents. Replacement of three switches in the Human Services, Public Works, and the library. New switches will accommodate upgraded upgraded speeds and capacity for future upgrades. Required um, cameras, phones, and other network functions. Request is going to be included in the FY24 capital budget, but became more critical and needs immediate replacement. Take it away. <laughs> Can. Yeah, there was just a, there was a very, um, I don't think it can wait that long. In terms like of, dire straits. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so we want to address this before it becomes a problem. Okay. And they're moving it. It's a line item transfer, which is good. So yes. not, uh, you know, be out of the FY24 budget, which is good too. 
So I will move acceptance of line item transfer 23-07 in the amount of $15,804.61. Is there a second? Second. Anyone have any questions for Tony or anyone else? Hearing none, I'll call the roll. Beth Heller, aye. Sheila McCreven? Aye. Joe Crisco? Aye. David Rogel? Aye. David Lover? Aye. And Paul Kyriakos? Aye. And that passes unanimously. I think we're done with the funding requests and line That's items. That's it. Chris, okay. Yep. Move on to item uh, C, which is bid waiver requests. And the first one is the public works truck from a state contract. And there's a memorandum from Warren to Tony in your packet. Hopefully you had a chance to read it. Um, but I'll let Warren still here. I'm still here. Get a little explanation here. Yeah, we we um, have been holding off on this as everybody's aware that I have uh, requested funds to be put aside in the six year plan. And uh, we haven't had the style truck that we're requesting in uh, quite a few years. And uh, it's a smaller dump truck for everybody that knows that we call it a Mason truck. Uh, basically it's a, a heavy duty pickup with a, a body on it that's smaller than the normal thing that we would go out and plow roads with. We use it for mason repairs, patching uh, roads, uh, and various tasks that we might have, picking up uh, town trash, uh, et cetera. Uh, the, the drawback with, with this is it is a state contract we request, and the dealer has indicated to me that availability is going to be uh, possibly withheld because, um, as with the police vehicles, they, they, what they do is put the production and there's certain allocations. So if you don't have an order in, um, you, you might not get the vehicle even though you put the request in. <clears throat> and if you have the request in, there's a good possibility the way this vehicle is being built because it's going to be entirely built at the factory. Uh, we don't have to buy a cabin chassis and have the components installed. There might be a better shot of getting the delivery direct from the factory. <clears throat> so the truck is specced out and and um, using the fake as described in the memo. Uh, that's that's what the intent is. Anyone have any questions for Warren on this or Tony? This is the. Um... This we've made this request a number of times, right, Warren? And somehow or other, it kind of gets declined in the budget process. Well, the truck, the last truck that we had, it was in service. It was bought in 1993. When that became inoperable, we had bought another truck. It was uh, something that was not suited for. It, it's a heavier duty truck smaller in, in size, but that truck in itself has been aging and it's got a lot of downtime. This Actually. this truck is, is um, it's a smaller truck. It's bigger than a pickup, but the cabin chassis is like a heavy duty uh, pickup with a dump body on it. I see. And and uh, yes, the, the, the fund, we have to shift because of budget allocation it might get shifted from one year to another year, if that's what you're you're uh, referring to. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So tonight we're being asked to approve a bid waiver request for the purchase for the small Mason style truck as, um, as discussed or explained to us by Warren Connors. So with that, it's a state contract. So I'm assuming that's the best price. Yes, it is. Okay, so with that, I will move forward on this uh, approval of the bid waiver request. Is there a second? Second. Anyone have any other questions or comments on this? Hearing none, uh, Selectman David Vogel? Aye. Selectman David Lover? Aye. Selectman Paul Kyriakos? Aye. Selectman Joe Crisco? Aye. Selectman Sheila McCreven? Aye. And, and Beth Heller? Aye. Thank you very much. That's the first one. Next one is the mower. Um, acquisition of the new boat, 
boom roadside mower also i believe off the state bid maybe you want to give us a quick summary of this one why we're using why we're asking for a bid waiver for this well a the the price and the uh where the contract is available uh without going through a bid process um it's it's already on the state contract and we get uh i think tony mentioned earlier uh the the source well um type we can get a, a discount through them uh it is part of the state contract and the vendor um the way it works is it goes through the dealer on the source well thing the purchase order is made to the company and, and then it's just delivered through the dealer <clears throat> um like i mentioned earlier uh, i saw this at the equipment show and and um other municipalities are utilizing this same mower uh it's it's let's say built differently so it would transport on the road uh from the one road location to another much better uh than the existing mower and it will stay tighter to the gutter line when the mowing actually takes place as opposed to what we currently have sometimes the mower has to move out to the middle of the road just to, to mow right on the shoulder so this can stay it's confined it does basically the same job um and and it's it's like i said my research and physically seeing the machine best best thing for for my perspective and other municipalities uh testing and ver validating it confirm the same same issue so that's why we're requesting this mow Okay, so the request is actually for a bid waiver to purchase the this roadside mower from Tri County Contractor Supply. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, we'll move, move acceptance of that bid waiver. Is there a second? Second. Does anyone have any questions for Warren or Tony on this one? Hearing none. Um, uh, uh, well, didn't we just buy a boom mower? Uh, uh, what did I dream that? No, this this boom mower was purchased in 1997. No, no, no. I'm saying, didn't we have, just have a funding request for a boom mower? Is that was yeah. that was the funding yeah. request? This is the purchasing piece. The bid oh. waiver part. Because we otherwise we have to go out to bid and get you know write a bid spec and get quotes and all this other stuff. So this just we didn't dream know, it. It us, happened a few minutes ago. It allows us to piggyback on another bid process so that we don't have to go through that process. Ah. Uh. So this is a this is a motion for the bid waiver. Okay. Any other questions? We have a motion and a second, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do that. Okay. Uh, Beth Heller votes aye. Sheila McCreven. Aye. Joe Prisco. Aye. Paul Kyriakos. Aye. David Vogel. Aye. And David Loper. Aye. Thank you so much. Last but not least, uh, Bid waiver for fiscal year 23 vehicle purchases. This is the two that we just approved. For police. Right. Correct. Uh, Correct. Right. Okay. So this is just a a bid waiver for to go to use the state bid process, correct? For both these vehicles? Right, because the state buys, you know, hundreds of cars. So it would make sense for us to use the same bid price. So, so I will move acceptance of bid waiver for the Explorer four-wheel drive SUV hybrid and one new 2022 Police Department Ford Utility all-wheel drive SUV. That's it. Second, thank you. Any questions for Chief? I think he's still here, yep. Tony, anyone else? Hearing none, um, call on Selectman David Vogel. Aye. David Lober. Aye. Joe Crisco. Aye. Sheila McCreven. Aye. Paul Curicos. Aye. And Beth Heller. Hi. Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank the board for their time and for the approval of our purchases. Thank you for joining thank us this evening. Okay, take care. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one more item and then we can go to public comments. Uh, that is uh, item D. We get all through all the bid waivers, Tony? We did. We okay. did, yeah. Uh, discussion on natural gas authorized the first selectman and finance director to lock in the price. I'll take this one, hand it over to 
Tony. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we we have a, um, a we have locked in our gas pricing. Uh, we're ending a, th a three year contract where we had our price uh, per decatherm at six dollars and thirty six cents. The um, due to the um, world events and other matters. Um, currently, the uh, utility, if you stay with the utility, if it's a floating price, and I think right now it's in the eleven and a half dollar range or thereabouts, so it's a little less than twice uh, what uh, we're paying currently. Our contract expires next month. Hmm. So the question we have in front of us is, do we just float with the price and uh, take our chances? And... Um, you know, so immediately we'd be at eleven, twelve dollars, and it could go here, and um, based on what's happening in the world, or maybe it doesn't. Uh, the um, other choice we have is to lock into a price. So a thirty-six month price would be seventeen dollars and forty-six cents. So the question here is do we lock in for a, um, a th three year price that, just so to give you a frame of reference, a two year price is $18 and 70 cents. So if you wanted to just lock in for two years, you would be at $18 and 70 cents, three years is 1746, one year is $20 and 25 cents. That's per decatherm. Keep in mind, we currently pay $6 and 36 cents. Um, or do we float and, you know, it could, Keep going higher. I mean, I obviously don't have a crystal ball. I will tell you that typically we um, lock in with um, Amity and Beach uh, Woodbridge Board of Education in the town. And some years we go with um, other towns. Uh, the Amity at their meeting, um, I think it was Monday, decided not to lock in and decided to float with the market. Um, so, you know, there's a risk there, of course. You know, sometimes the price you know is better than the one you might get that yeah. you don't know. But that's the question here. Um, so, Tony, Tony, did you say what is the price of the current price for like a month? If we didn't want to lock in, what what it would be eleven? Yeah, so you could wait a month and it's eleven dollars, eleven and chip. It's actually next month, so I could we could come back to you next month and I can give you an update. That's certainly an option. But the market right now is eleven dollars. Let's say the utility, yeah. Every month, I think the utility changes its price. So if every month it'll change, it's in the mid 11s somewhere, 11, 20, 11, 30, somewhere like that. Yeah. So um, it, it could go up and um, you could you could hold off and see where it heads and I could update you on the pricing. But I wanted to just give you an idea of where we're at here. Our electricity contract is not up for another year. Currently, just to give you an idea, currently our electricity is at, 0.79 cents per kilowatt. Uh, and um, I think the market right now is, uh, I've got it right here, hold on. 14, 15, 16, 18 cents. So hopefully that goes down before we our contract is up with our electricity. Uh, Tony, um, how much typically do we spend a year on gas? I would say, um, Probably, I'd say we probably spend at least forty, fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand. Mm. Yeah. So that would. So if it goes, you know, doubles essentially. Or, or triples. This is triple just a generation. Line. This is just a generation piece. So of the fifty thousand dollars, you know, I don't, I don't have the exact figures. I can I can actually get those for the next meeting. But um, of the fifty thousand dollars, half of it say is generation. Half of it is. Uh, delivery, right? Right. That's that's the electricity. This, Actually, I was I the question I wanted to ask was about the gas utilization. Yeah, that number is you know that's that's the gas utilization. Electric is more. Oh, the gas transmission fee for gas yeah. as well. Oh, oh. yeah. Electric's got to be. It's a lot more than that. Mm. We spent just fifty thousand at the library, I think, or forty, forty or fifty at the library. So. Um, the, that's the gas. We don't spend quite as much, but I can get those for you next month and we can re re revisit the uh, discussion if you'd like. But I, I just wanted to give you an idea of, you know, mm -hmm. we're, what we're facing here and we could lock in right now. It, it would be, you know, you know, we'd, but the lowest number we can lock in now is what? $17 and 46 cents. 
three years. So that would be that be so, triple what we're spending now. Right, and if in two years, if the price drops because the world is more stable and the price gas prices are more stable, you know, we could still be paying seventeen dollars and forty six cents. However, it could go the opposite direction. The prices right. could get higher. You just sometimes you just don't know. You know, it's not it's not an easy decision. But um, you know, I I I, I tend to favor a locking in because then you could you it's easier to do your budget. But um, this is a much bigger increase than we're used to. You know, lock in. Sometimes when you lock in, it's a little bit more, but you have that stability. Mm -hmm. This is three times as much. Right. So that's just if the futures, the if the lock in is basically off of futures pricing, that tends to give you an idea of where prices are going. Right. Typically. Mm -hmm. Typically, anyway. I mean, trip, triple sounds like an awful lot. I, we haven't seen that in oil. Why are we seeing that in gas? We don't know. Well, the gas is a few reasons that I've um, first is uh, the limited supply in Connecticut, the, the number of pipelines. We only have two pipelines. Um, and secondly, is some of our gas is being shipped over to um, to Europe to um, Europe. supply Europe, right? So that puts pressure on our prices because of supply and demand, basic supply and demand, right? If the Russian uh, gas is not being sent to Europe, then it puts pressure on the rest of the supply. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the reason for the big jump. Tony, can I ask you a couple of questions about what uh, it, this is inclusive of Beecher Road School, or they have a separate line item in their budget? And so they, the, this, they, have, they have a separate line item in their budget, and they, um, but they, we typically do things together. Right. So this is all the town buildings. They're all on gas now. We have no oil. Uh, we just have oil at the Darling House. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, the rest of the town are on gas. Yes. Right. So, you know, if we're looking at costs like this, um, we, and we're also talking about trying to be more sustainable, if we could convert things so that we were, um, you know, doing electric heat pumps instead in these out years of a, I mean, I guess three years is not enough time for us to convert things, is it? Probably not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's something to think about going forward. If we can get more sustainable, we can not be subject to these less reliance on right. You're less reliant on these price swings. Yeah. Okay. So the question to the board tonight is: Do you want us to lock in now, or do you want to wait till next month? So right. locking in would be a higher question. price than you'd pay if you were floating right now. <laughs> yeah, you would pick correct. This is higher than if you just decided to not do anything. Yeah. But next next month, the lock in price may be two dollars more. I Correct. Know. Next I know. month, at seventeen forty-six could be nineteen fifty. Tony and I looked at ourselves this afternoon. What should we do? Do you have a crystal ball? Right. We don't know what to do. So bring it to the board. And you're what saying you Amity is floating for now. Amity decided not to lock in and to float for now. Okay. And I'm not sure about this feature. They have. I don't think they've met yet. So um, I turn to you, members, to. I would either. I mean, you could either lock in, or we can try another month and see where the numbers take us. But Tony, if Amity doesn't if Amity doesn't lock in and they float and they go sour on them, their budget that goes right back to us again just reflects that next year. That's right? true. That's Same true. Same for Beecher. There's, Same for no, Beecher. Right. There, there's no cost to them other than egg on their face if they guess wrong, but it doesn't really affect their pocketbook in any real way. Right. For mm -hmm. us. That's true. For us, we're hitting the same people. The taxpayer is going to pay. Right. Um, I think we need to get a little more information over another month and, and wait. Yeah, that that's fine. I think that's, that's, I think it's reasonable. We can do that. You know, also, Tony, can we find out who, uh, what Bethany and Orange are doing as towns? Bethany, as well? Bethany doesn't have, yeah, we could. Bethany doesn't have gas. And um, Orange is, I'm not sure. I can find out. Hmm. Thanks. Tony, I don't have a crystal ball either, but we're not the only ones that are going to be burning gas this winter. And I can't imagine that the government is going to ignore an a price increase like this with so many people being being hit by inflation. Um, so there may be some stabilization that, that's, uh, that's forced on these gas companies. I think I would float. Yeah, okay. Okay. I can certainly give you an update next month, and and we can compare the two, and we can go from there. Uh, until at least after election season. 
Uh, Joe and Paul, Sheila, you <laughs> consensus with that in agreement? Yeah. Okay. I agree. Wait and see is the the way to go. Fingers crossed. Okay, so yeah. we'll have the okay. signing agenda for next month and I'll let you know. Okay, Tony. But, I, but I, I do think we should consider at some future at some future point Sheila's idea of going to heat pumps and solar power and trying to get out of out of this cycle of using fossil fuel because we're you know you're captive. We really are captive. It's true. Very true. Yep. Yep. Okay. Tony. I do have another other, just a quick other other. Okay. <laughs> so um the uh town has um in engaged a uh, an engineer to review the review the pool uh the condition of the pool the condition of the filters we have a had a small leak there if you recall uh, a few months back and so um, we're hoping that report is done end of next week and then uh they're going to have short term mid term and long term um suggestions for repairs <laughs> and maintenance so once we have that we'll share that with you was it or to come okay. yes yeah uh, tony is that something potentially that could get added to the building committee's charge if need be it could particularly if there are um significant and expensive uh fixes mm -hmm. or repairs necessary how old is that pool tony 70 50 years i think oh so they did all kinds of testing on the structure and the stability and the um, the equipment and the, the lines and the, all the stuff that, you know. So. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, okay. And now we will go back to item which would be about five, I believe. Uh, public comments. Uh, Mrs. Shaw, do you have any public comments that were submitted to be read by 3 p.m. today? No, none were received by 3 p.m. today. Thank you. Is there anyone in attendance that wishes to give public comment for the board? <laughs> I have no attendees in the waiting room. Okay. All righty then. Thank you so much. We will move on back to um, next item seven, strategic plan ARPA committee. I will call on Selectmen McCrevin and Vogel. David or Sheila, whoever wants to start. Yes, so we've um, provided some information in the packet tonight to keep everyone up to date. Uh, I don't think much has changed, maybe a word or two in the strategies themselves. So the th first three pages there with our uh, 13 different strategies under three goal areas. But next you will see in the packet that we have, um, I think this is something that Tony Genovese put together for us. It's a way of considering potential ARPA funding projects in the categories of our strategic plan. So we're, we, we're beginning a look at this. And then in the subsequent pages from that cover on ARPA, you'll see the requests themselves. So all the details of the requests that have come in. Um, obviously, Tony starts us off as he always does with, uh, this is the dollar amount you have. <laughs> and then here are all these requests that have come in. Right, right, so, right. The tough work in front of us as a committee, and Tony and uh, David, if you want to jump in and discuss this, uh, at the bottom of that first cover page about ARPA, you see the process laid out. So what we'd like to do tonight is hear from any members of the Board of Selectmen who either have questions or concerns or something they would like us to just flag for us to, to further consider. And then we need to come back because eventually this has to get to a public hearing of some sort or a public meeting. Right. I, so, do you guys have more to add to this? I think you you guys have done a great job. Well, this is mostly Tony now. It was Tony okay. and Betsy for a while, and now we've okay. he's doubled up his efforts now. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think I think we're definitely slowing down without Betsy's help. That's no yeah. part. It's definitely. Far. Tony and I are but just uh, doing triage every day. Yeah, it's, it's, it puts Betsy. a lot more load on Tony, and and uh, I would just say that that. Uh, you know, we, we do need at some point to not only uh, bless the strategic plan or or go, tell the strategic planning committee to go back to the drawing board and address deficiencies in the plan. Uh, and I, we do need, as, as Sheila suggested, a little more 
public input. We don't get much of that, as you can see from our public comments uh, not happening. And I'm, I'm certainly in, all in favor of, of more opportunity for the public. Uh, that goes for us in general as a board. I, I was, it was too bad that we had planned to have a in-person meeting and then we, we switched it. I think we're missing out uh, collectively on knowledge that we would hear from our public. And it makes it very difficult for us to function. I think to the point where, uh, you know, we, we, we come up against so many rules. I feel like I can't really even talk to you, the board, as colleagues without filing some freedom of information problem because you're not from the same party that I'm in or whatever it happens to be. And yet we're not in any one place where we're receiving collective information from town members at the same time. So we're not seeing hearing the same information. It's, it can do a lot of things, but it won't do a lot of things if we start chipping away at random. So it's, you know, I think all these things sequentially are quite important for us and I hope we can uh, do some of that tonight. So what are your recommended next steps? Uh, next step would be for us to look at the, to ratify that this is the, this is the way we want to go with the strategic plan. I mean, there can be a lot of, it can always be amended. We can amend it every single meeting if we want to. But if we're way off base, I think the, the you, you guys ought to tell us. The board should say, you know, this isn't right or whatever. And then, and then we keep moving. Okay. Anyone have any comments? That sound right, Sheila? Yeah, I, I would like to especially echo what you're saying that the ARPA money that's coming uh, our way is the public's money. And we are definitely going to need to reach out and inform the public and get their consent and their approval and their input as we're making the plans to spend it. As you can see from this submission, and I think this submission is like all these details, if they're not already on the town website, I'd like to see that this packet gets on the town website. So folks, if they are interested in finding out more of these details, um, we can't fund all of these things. And the question, I think, if if we could get some input from the board tonight. Should we be looking at trying to fund all of them a little, or should we target our spending a little more um, in a more defined way? Especially as David's mentioning, um, there are some things that can be funded in our regular budget process uh, and perhaps should be funded in our regular budget process because they're core services and they're uh, repairs and infrastructure and things that, that we have an obligation to fund. And if this is once in a lifetime money, should we be allocating it to a once in a lifetime, like this project would not happen any other way except for this money? And then how much should we weigh the funding there? So those are questions for the Board of Selectmen. If you give us some guidance, I think next step would be that at our next strategic planning committee, we really kind of parse through this and, and start to attach dollar amounts to you know, which of these projects we feel belong in this category, and conversely, which one should go back into the budget process. So the, the body cameras here that, that um, Chief Capiella talked about, you know, I, I think we heard tonight that we're going to fund that in a different way. Um, but what are your other thoughts? Uh, any other input for us? Well said. Yeah, that Well, I'd, I'd kind of want to stay away from the strategy of funding a whole lot of things um, uh, to a very small amount. Um, what I, I think the real danger is if we start a whole bunch of small projects and then somehow they, they kind of run out of money and run out of support and so on and so forth. I, I think really we need to focus on where we want to spend our money. 
and maybe that that bears some discussion. Um, I think there's a real danger in in going off in several different directions and just having that money just be wasted because we're not able to fully fund each of those items. Yeah, I think it's helpful to attach a dollar to some of these things that are listed because I can't decide which one depending on what the cost is. Um, I also wanted to bring to your attention, maybe I'll ask Jerry Weiner to speak to this. Um, you're there, Jerry. Yep. Uh, goal two is strategy six, the determine the CCW future use. Things have changed a little bit since you guys developed this. And maybe, Jerry, you should speak to that before we... So very briefly, Beth, thank you very much. I would suggest sure. that we hold off on anything involving the country club at this point until uh, we know a little bit more about what's going on and where we're going. Okay. Yeah, you because know, I highlighted that as one of the things that I had some concerns about, you know, bringing up future to the public and things like that. So maybe the next step is to get some dollar dollars attached to some, you know, rough dollars attached to some of these things, which maybe guide us. Obviously, everything is wonderful and needed. Question is, I don't think we can afford with 2.6 million, I believe, Tony. Is that what it is? Actually, 2.3 now because we've allocated $275,000 towards the senior center. Right. Okay. So it's 2.3. So, so we have that amount of money, and it would be nice to know is there a way to spend it all? I'm sure there is. And are there are things that we sure should spend it on, and things perhaps we should delay or not do at all. Right. And one other aspect is there may be other uh, sources of revenue. So you see in the notes that uh, we, we consider something for a steep grant, for example. Um, the other thing that I'd, I'd like to get for our next strategic planning meeting is a little bit of a better sense of what the Woodbridge Board of Ed is planning to do with their uh, federal grant money that's related to the coronavirus relief, um, as well as Amity, because Amity is also um, receiving money. So uh, we should at least know where that is being targeted before we go ahead and move some of our projects forward, because there may be some opportunities here that we can dovetail funding or, or we could do something that is making sure that projects are getting done one way or another. I, I just want to make a, a comment too on um, the first uh, goal, the first project suggestion. Um, there, as you all know, there's a, a public meeting tomorrow on that. And so ho hopefully um, that one will start to take a little more shape in the, in the near future. So, and I know that's a big, you know, number one, obviously number one priority on the list here. So, yeah, so it, it may be helpful to hear from the 2030 committee a little bit more uh, what, right. what their consultant is telling them they need to be going. Cause we yeah. wanna, we wanna reinforce that. We don't wanna be at cross purposes with that. Right, I think mm -hmm. that their meeting tomorrow night at NEBCO is to encourage public input at this point. I know, Beth, uh, you've had a lot of input and met with our committee on numerous occasions. And, and uh, I would just like, if, if there are discrepancies in, in what other board members are thinking about what, what our priorities should be, what order we should have things in, uh, what we've left out, what we've, you know, what we've done too much with, I'd just like to hear that either not necessarily in this meeting, but individually, uh, discussion-wise, an email or whatever it might be, so that we're so that the, so that we know that we're in the right track. I don't know. Attend, is, is attend that, the uh, subcommittee. Would yeah, be great because too. I think it has to be public. I don't think you can do communications through emails for the well, voice. Then, I'm not well, sure. Well, they can correspond with us. But we'll just make that correspondence public. But even better, if you want to come to um, our upcoming meeting, we we do not have a date set. So um, if anyone on the board of selectmen is interested in attending, maybe we can make sure that we can find a date that works for everyone. So sure. Something like that. Just just so that just so that we're not running away from 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 That's the fine. rest of the board. Yeah. And and we should be clear since we're in a public meeting and the public is also invited to attend these meetings. We would love to uh, we we have had a member of the public attend and it would be great to have more plural. <laughs> That's good. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so thank you. So now you have somewhat of your work cut out. Okay, thank you both. Um, the next item on the agenda is item eight, and we have a consent agenda with action as appropriate. I hope and assume that all of you have read through each and every one of these items. 
Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I did it this <laughs> afternoon. Um, so with that, is there anything, I guess I just take a motion to approve the consent agenda. Is that correct? Yep. This is new to me. Okay. So I'll accept a motion to approve the consent agenda as it presented in your packet. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. And uh, any discussion on any of the items? Hearing none. Wow, this takes a lot off our plate. Uh, I will yeah, motion, to, motion to approve. Sheila McCreven. Aye. Thank you. Joe Crisco. Aye. Paul Kirikos. Aye. David Lover. Aye. Sorry. <laughs> and David Vogel. Aye. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Item nine, <clears throat> appointments. And, oh, by the way, I will just add that I am going to send, uh, we'll, we'll just, we accept the resignation of uh, Arthur Katz with regret. Can't really say that as part of the consent agenda, but just want to add that. Okay. Um, lost my agenda. Papers all over the place here. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is appointments, received nominations and action is appropriate. The first one is the town plan and zoning alternate till 2025. Um, Sheila, do you have a nomination? I do. I'd like to nominate Chadi Nujane and the uh, resume is in the packet. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, David or David, do you have a nomination for this one? I do. And I have a question, uh, about it because, uh, uh, as you know, I'm not always in agreement with the way we do these things. Oh, the, uh, the question that I have is uh, the town list that my nominating committee from our party had uh, listed this alternate position that was vacant as a Republican site, as a Republican or, you know, a non-majority party uh, seat. And uh, that was something that came from Tony at, at the not, uh, you know, I think at the desk uh, that our nominating committee had uh, based on the list of all the boards and commissions. Uh -huh. So I'm, is there some confusion on that or am I correct that that is a, that, that what, what I saw from the town is accurate that this is a nominally a Republican or a, or a non-Democrat seat? I, be I believe so. Um, Chadi is a Republican. Okay. I'm just. Um, did you send in a nomination to this? To the, do you have one? Because there's nothing in the packet here. Right. Uh, I believe we'd sent that in earlier before it was deemed that this one's going to be on this thing to a previous meeting. Uh, we we would like to nominate Joe Dye for the uh, TPZ alternate. Okay. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Okay, with that. Okay, any other nominations? There are none. Okay, we will first vote on Chadi New Nujam. Uh, Beth Heller, aye. aye. Sheila McCreven. Aye. Frisco. Aye. Paul Kirikos. Aye. David Lover. Aye. Uh, no, sorry, no. Okay, and David Vogel. Uh, no. Thank you. Chadi is the nomination is filled. Next one is uh, let's see. Okay. Commission for the use of publicly owned properties to 2025. Sheila, do you have a nomination? Yes, I'd like to nominate Javier Aviles. Is there a That's second? In the packet. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. David, do you have a nomination? No. Okay. All right, thank you. We'll Put forward now, Javier Aviles. Uh, Beth Teller, aye. Sheila McCreven. Aye. Joe Crisco. Aye. Paul Curiacos. Aye. David Sorry. Loper. Uh, aye. Thank you, and David Vogel. Aye. Thank you very much. And the next one on the list is Government Access Television Commission. We don't have any nominations yet. We're working on it. So if you guys have someone, please send them in. Thank you. Next one is the Library Commission to 2023. Um, Sheila, do you have a nomination? I don't think you do, correct? 
Uh, no, but there is one in the packet. I see that. Uh, David. <laughs> yeah. David, look at the Cindy's act. For it. Yep. Is there a second? I'll second her. Very nice lady. I had a nice conversation with her. Mm -hmm. She is. She's wonderful. Yeah. Any other nominations? Hearing none. Uh, Beth Heller, aye. Sheila McCreven. Aye. Joe Crisco. Aye. Paul Kyriakos. Aye. David Lober. Aye. And David Vogel. Aye. Thank you. And get that gets us through the nominations. And we move on to item 10, Town Council's report. Mr. Weiner, receive an action as appropriate. Number one, the charge for reconstituted Woodbridge Housing Opportunities Committee. Jerry, take it away. So I think you all have uh, the proposed charge to the new uh, housing committee. Um, this is uh, consistent with what the town uh, did um, with the study committee, with the housing study committee. As you know, we timely filed our plan with the state of Connecticut, our housing plan as presented to us by the housing committee. Uh, I don't know if you've all read, but we were one of the minority of town that actually filed on time, which I think was a very, very constructive thing for us to do and I'm uh, very pleased that we did it. So this committee uh, expressed a desire to uh, continue with, with work on studying housing in, in, in Woodbridge. Um, Beth thought it was a good idea and we're presenting this uh, proposed charge uh, to the um, Board of Selectmen for approval. Keep in mind, notice that it's no longer a study committee. They've already done their study under the um, under the state statute. This will be an ongoing committee uh, to serve uh, at the pleasure uh, of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, so uh, I would ask that you all, unless you have some questions, uh, approve this uh, charge. Okay, I will move that we acceptance or approve the establishing in charge to the Woodbridge, just to get the discussion started, uh, to the Woodbridge Housing Committee. Is there a second? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I'll open it up for discussion. I have a question. Go ahead, David. Uh, is, so is this committee, uh, I'm unclear since most of our committees are formed under, ordin under the ordinances, correct? Isn't that the boards and commissions are? Uh, is this kind of a, is this an ad hoc committee? Is it or is it just a committee of the board? Or what what's what's its official kind of? Where does it fit in the in the uh, overall structure of our government? In the, it's not a board a board of commission. Obviously, that would require a uh, an ordinance. This is a first selectman's. Uh, uh, I don't know whether you want to call it ad hoc because it's going to have a definite. You know, it's going to be effective for a couple of years. So it is a committee that the first selectman has decided to uh, thought that it would be in the best interest of the town to create and, and uh, asking the board's uh, approval. Okay. They actually came to me and asked if they could continue their work given where we are in the town. So, so the second question is that in the plan that we submitted to the state, which I don't remember right offhand all of the specifics, <laughs> did we say that we were going to do such a committee or anything? Was that mentioned in our in our housing plan that we were going to have some kind of a help in this, or was it just a new? It's kind of organically happened. I think that Beth is. I don't think it's in the housing plan. I think that Beth is correct that the committee thought that they work so well together, and this is such an uh, important topic, an interesting topic, they requested that they thought it would be a good idea to continue, and I think Beth has agreed that it is is a good idea. I personally feel it's a great idea in view of where we are today. Uh, Jerry, I just wanted to ask, I think it was in, their in the actual um, document that we accepted it was among the things that they were going to ask for, but I'm not sure if they were going to ask to be an official commission up at that level that David's suggesting that goes through ordinance or whether they were uh, aiming to be a committee itself. If in the future we wanted to move this as make it a permanent commission, it, would it just then go to ordinance and then we'd go through that process? Correct. You 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 might be right that they did ask for it. I don't remember, but it's yeah, I do. Not, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think you're right, and I don't think they asked for a commission. They just wanted to continue on as a committee. Right. So this is essentially ad hoc until we make it a commission. There's really only kind of two kinds of animals uh, with stripes here, right? Correct. Any other comments from the board? 
Will this, do you think this will require any more funding? Uh, is it likely to have some staff time? I mean, we're short on all of those things. What, what do you envision, Beth, as your, your housing committee, you know, who are they going to work with there at town hall and how's that going to? Well, we hope we have some, uh, another person hired shortly to begin to help us with staffing issues. So stay tuned. Okay. Chris Sullivan uh, was, was the staff for the uh, housing committee study. Right. So I assume she will be asked to help them as well on technical issues. Not that she has to go to every meeting, but right. be certainly available for, for, for advice for them. Did an awful lot of work to get that done first time. Okay. Just Thanks. wondering how we're, you know, how we're stacking on things uh, onto the staff as well. That's a, that's always an issue. Okay. With that, uh, no other comments. I will call the question. Uh, uh, let's see. I got to start again here. Roll call. Beth Heller. Aye. Sheila McCreven. Aye. Joe Crisco. Aye. Paul Kyriakos. Aye. David Lober. Aye. And David Vogel. Aye. Thank you very much. The next one is the charge for the feature building committee. They are anxiously awaiting this to get started. Is that right? Is that the next one I've got here? Yep. Is it is it true that we're anxiously awaiting to get started, Beth? <laughs> there you go. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. You're one of the way. Yeah. I had a meeting. We are keen we are keen to get started. Yes. Well, I had a meeting with the, I guess. Tony and I had a meeting with Christine and, and last week and, and Donna, you know, from the board. And they, Once and, we get approved, we can start meeting. Yep. So hopefully you've all had a chance to review this. Any questions, comments? I, I just had one question. I know that infrastructure improvement was the name of the last Beecher Building Committee, which was intended to be like a kind of once in a lifetime uh, investment in the building. I wonder if we want the name of this to be the um, more geared towards repair and maintenance, uh, which is what these projects all seem to be about. Um, but maybe that's something we could come back. I, I saw that you mentioned that other building committee changed the name of their building committee at a later date, Beth. So if you want this committee to get started and then we might come back with a, a name change. Is that possible? That's reasonable. Okay. Sure. Can't think of anything tonight. Right. Yeah, yeah. They wanted to add culture to the the uh, community center, which is a good thing. <laughs> okay. Does anyone have any questions on this or comments? Reading it through, I think it's pretty thorough. So with that, I will motion that we approve the establishment the, the charge of the establishment of in charge of the Beach Road School Infrastructure Upgrade Building Committee that was presented to New Packet. Is there a second? Second. Any other comments? Okay, Selectman David Vogel. Aye. Selectman Lover. Aye. Selectman Kyriakos. Aye. Selectman Crisco. Aye. Selectman McCreven. Aye. And Beth Heller says aye too. Thank you very much. Jerry, thank you for your help with these, getting them drafted in the, the right way. Appreciate Ooh. that. Okie doke, uh, support letter to the trust for public land regarding 124 Seymour Road. I mentioned this briefly in my remarks. We are now at that point in your packet. Anything uh, on this? This, parent, this, let, this property is apparently for sale. And as I understand it, when Tony and I had a meeting with um, Tim Austin, the, uh, let me find this thing. Um, the, the issue is that the parcel, um, the town's current open space plan states that the trail has received official greenway designation. It's all, it's all written up in your letter. The issue is that the, the Trust for Public Land um, would like to work on perhaps, I believe, purchasing Tony or can't remember. What did they want us to? There are a number of ways that you could um you could uh, accomplish that goal without actually outright purchasing it. I think they're going to look at all different. Right. We made it very clear that um, we were not going to provide any money toward this, but we would be willing, would be willing to send a letter of support for them moving forward to keep this parcel. It, it apparently has something to the Greenway, and they'd like to connect it, use it as a connectivity to that, I believe. I had a question about the... Um... 
I guess the final paragraph of the letter, uh, when we're talking about two different groups, it's the land trust and the town of Woodbridge, because the Conservation Commission is only acting on behalf of the town of Woodbridge, is that right? They, they don't exist outside the town of Woodbridge, right? So they're, that would be that would be the town of Woodbridge working on this. So I wonder if it should be changed to the, the work of the land trust, because it's the land trust that is potentially going to fund it. With the, the um, trust for public land. Right, but I, I just want to make sure, I, I, I think I understand the Woodbridge Conservation Commission is not acting independent of the town, right? Oh, correct. Okay. How would we change that? I don't know. You, you're talking about the draft for approval. Yeah, and just because we're we're saying no town money, so no conservation money either, right? Right, but I don't think you need to change it. Uh, I really don't. I think it's probably uh, uh, understandable. I think this. Might well, it's not a separate group from us, though, right? It's like we're thanking them to for working with us when we're thanking them for working with the conservation commission. Well, well, it's not a legal separate group, but it is an entity that is, you know. Uh, Authorized by the ordinance. So it does have some identity. It's not legally responsible for anything. The town backs, backs it up. But I do think it's a it's an entity that uh, is recognized by our ordinances. So I think in that in that terms it is. Right. And they and they primarily, or I think exclusively actually, just make recommendations to the Board of Selectmen. Correct. I, I just wonder if they're gonna come back to us and now recommend that we spend um town money, but if Beth is saying we're not spending town money, I just want to make sure it's clear. Tony and I made that clear at the meeting with the conservation chair, and we will reiterate it should they do come back. <clears throat> you okay with the way it is? Well, the conservation commission has their own funding, some some of their own funding. I think they have about $70,000 in the bank, plus or minus. Oh, it's not. No, they it's, have, it's in yeah, the they, they have a budget of a few thousand dollars to operate the commission, but the seventy thousand dollars is belongs to it's under the town and the. It's in the open orders. space fund or something. That's correct. earmarked for land purchase, though, is it not? It's for open space purchases, correct? Mm -hmm. But so it this would fall under that. Uh, it would probably that definition. Would I would yeah. Oh, they'd have to come to the town. Right. Right. But I'm saying that. That there is there is money earmarked for purchase of open space, but Beth is saying we're not going to spend any of that. Right. This is not. This isn't the. Re As I understand that the request is not not to purchase anything in behalf of the town. It is merely to lend support when they go to the state to try and get this. Um, whether they need funding or what what they need, They'll, they have to show the state that the town okay. is. Putting it as well as the conservation commission. So we're, 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 right, it's worthy of worthy of um, protection. Right. So we're that. we're putting our imprimatur on on this project, basically. Correct. Correct. Right. Thank you. Okay, so the letter as it stands, I'll make a motion that we approve it. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any other comments or discussions on this? Hearing none. Um, Beth Heller says aye. Sheila McCreven? Aye. Joe Crisco? Aye. Paul Kiriakos? Aye. David Lober? Aye. And David Vogel? Aye. Thank you very much. And next item is regarding the local election. Uh, Jerry's going to update us, for which is actually November 7th, 2023, just around the bend. So I, I just wanted to get this on the agenda to begin the discussion. There's a couple, or there's like basically one, um, well, a couple of decisions that the board needs to take as the legislative body of the town. As you know, uh, the, the law that was passed in the last legislative session automatically makes every town a November, a November uh, odd year, uh, every municipal uh, town, a November election day. Um, and we will, our next election, instead of May, will now be in November. Uh, all terms, it's clear, the, the law that was <laughs> clear that all terms of the existing elected officials get extended until uh, the next election. So you'll, instead of your term being up June 30th, your term, is, as well as all other elected officials in town, will be up after the November election. 
the question that we have to uh, that the legislative body has to decide is when do you, do you want to take office? When should the elected positions take office? And uh, I've been talking to the secretary of St secretary of state's office on and off for uh, six weeks, two months, or something. The, the, the statute is, is not clear. They didn't really think it out beyond requiring every town to be a November election town unless the town opts out by a three quarters vote of its legislative body. So the Board of Selectmen needs to decide when the terms uh, become official. Obviously, what we have now, July 1st, um, is a date that you all, all elected positions, take office after the May election. So the statute seems to say that the legislative body has seven, it could establish a date anywhere between 75 days from the election. Now, if the election is November 7th, count out 75. It could be any, any time within that. It could be two weeks after the election. It could be in December. It could be January 1st. Every town has different, different dates of starting the uh, elected officials. So... With that, with that in mind, I'd like you all to think about it. I'm still waiting for a return call from the uh, person at the Secretary of State's office to confirm this, and hopefully by the October meeting, we'll be in a position to make a recommendation and the board will be able to uh, to vote on it. The other issue that, that was really not covered by the new law and not thought of is when they, when they decided to pass this, is when do um, the terms of current appointed boards and commissions uh, uh, take place. Do they as well get extended if their term, right now their terms are up um, just as the elected officials are up on July 1st, the new new people become uh, become members. So we need to decide whether they should be tracking the elected officials, which makes the most sense to me. And uh, you know, you, you, the board can chime in on that uh, later on and have their terms begin either two weeks after the November election, uh, you know, or January 1st or December 15th. So those are the two decisions that have to be made. They're not monumental decisions, but they're important decisions. I just wanted to throw that out and see if you had any comments now. And if you don't, we hopefully will have some more information for you at the next meeting. Uh, Jerry. Yeah. Th that uh, our, our boards and commissions, since they aren't, weren't, weren't uh, in the original legislation that, that changed the four towns that still had spring elections. Uh, won't we have to change that in our charter if we're gonna change it? It's not in the state statute. So, so the, no, so, so, so the uh, initial reaction from the Secretary of State was that since the, uh, the, uh, the legislative body decides when the, um, their terms take effect, they can also do that for the appointed boards and commissions. And that's what I was told three months ago. And that makes sense as opposed to doing a whole charter revision for one issue. So um, I'll confirm that, uh, David, with them again. But I think it's going to be as simple as just making uh, when you when you decide when the elected officials take office, the next motion will be and the appointed elected officials, appointed officials take effect the same date or a different date, whatever whatever you want to do. And, and our terms, the, the elected officials' terms, are described in the charter as well, based on the May date, yeah, correct? Correct. So, so we're going to leave our charter specifying something different and just say, oh, no, that doesn't count, or it does seem like we ought to clean it up somehow. Maybe that might be something for the future. We can, we, you know, I've been talking to our town clerk about that. We can possibly put something in the charter indicating the passage of the state statute, which doesn't require any charter revisions at all. Um, it's just automatic uh, unless there's an opt out. And then that, that even doesn't require a charter right. uh, change. It's an automatic uh, act of the legislative body. Hmm. But, Jerry, I had a question because I know that this will impact some of our elected officials will be our Amity Board of Ed representatives. Um, and up at Amity, they have an organizational meeting where they vote on the chairman. And that takes place after the orange election, even though it's both Woodbridge and Bethany that used to elect in May and then have new people seated in July. Amity actually waits another six months for the orange uh, newly elected to be seated. They begin their terms December 1. 
Um, it seems to me that that's really fast to go from election day as late as November 8th to having people appointed and ready to serve December 1. Um, but if we were to opt for January 1, as I know a few of the other towns do, um, we'd be out of sync with Amity as well. So I guess it complicates things a little bit, and I'm not sure if we can perhaps find out what Bethany is planning to do. I don't know if they're going to be changing their date, and are they going to pick December 1, December 15, January 1? We'd all have different dates. So what, what I understand about Bethany, and this is hearsay, not, not, uh, not reliable, just hearsay, I'll just repeat it, that they, their elected officials are going to take office two weeks after the date of the election. I don't think they did anything about appointed officials because um, I'm not even sure they were aware that that's, that's an issue. And maybe they did it intentionally. I have no idea. But that what I believe is what they have done. And uh, they could have changed that in the last couple of weeks. So we have to we could follow up and see exactly when they're doing it. But their elected officials, I think, reliably are going to take office two weeks after the election. Wow, it, that's fast. Yeah, sometimes I have it have you take office the next the next day. You know, that's oh. that's really crazy. Yeah, uh, when you're spilling Middletown, the mayor took over the next day. I remember that. Right, right. Yeah. We we had that happen at Amity too when they were filling a a special election for one of those seats that was vacant. The person was sworn in that night, actually. Right. So we don't have so no votes today. I just wanted to get it out there, let the public know that this is an issue and have the board. Uh, think about it, and hopefully by the next meeting we'll have a little more information and make and be able to take some steps. That's great, Jerry. We'll keep it on the agenda for October. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. And with that, um, item eleven is the executive session and actions appropriate. Um, I will make a motion that we enter executive session pursuant to section one dash two hundred. Oh boy, six B of the Connecticut General Statutes. Discussion of pending litigation. Um, Open Communities Trust LLC at Al versus the Town and Planning Zoning Commission of the Town of Woodbridge at Al, and also pursuant to Section 1-206C of the Connecticut General Statute Security Devices Related to Dispatch with Selectman Paul Kirikos, giving us an update. And I would invite, invite in executive session um, Finance Director Tony Genovese and our attorney Jerry Weiner. So those individuals are, are going to be invited in for both general, uh, both executive sessions. Yes, please. No that's one, that's no my one. motion. Okay, good. Okay. Is the, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Sheila. And with that, I will call the roll. Uh, Beth Heller, aye. Sheila McCreven. Aye. Joe Fusco. Aye. Paul Kirikos. Aye. David Lober. Aye. And David Vogel. Aye. Thank you. And with that, we will ask meetings, meetings, and pull we'll forward to move the meeting. So we'll wait for that to happen, and then we'll be in executive session. Thank you, everyone. We are out of executive session. There were no motions made, no votes taken during executive session. And I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move. Second. Second. Okay, thank you. It's non-debatable, and we are now adjourned as of 7.43 p.m. Take care, everyone, and stay safe, and thank you. Take care. Okay.